This channel is part of the History Hit Network. If you think archaeologists with their strange haircuts and their bizarre dress sense and their obsession with all the rubbish from ancient civilizations are a funny lot, you ain't seen nothing yet. Phil and I are in Montana, in the wild west of the USA. And every summer, what seem like half the eccentrics in the universe turn up here to dig for even larger remains from times even longer ago. We're here to meet the dinosaur hunters. We want to find out what they do and how they do it. And hopefully even have a go ourselves. Will a new betrayal? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You haven't directed us wrong because we Look, haven't passed a turning for 75 miles. It's I've been an awful long way back. I've navigated you skillfully to Wolf Creek. Yeah. We've turned left at the 287. We will go through Augusta and we will now. Montana is in the northwest corner of the US and it's empty. It's about the size of England, but has a population of just 900,000. But 65 million years ago and beyond, it was full of dinosaurs. In those days, known as the Cretaceous period, America looked a bit different. The continent was split down the middle by a huge ocean, and the Rockies were only just beginning to form. What's now Montana was a fertile plain sandwiched between mountains and sea. The landscapes changed, but in those days it was home to all kinds of fabulous beasts. Hadrosaurs, Triceratops, Torosaurs, Troodon, and of course the terrifying Tyrannosaurids. They're all just names at the moment, but over the next three weeks and 1,500 miles, we hope to meet and even bag a few for ourselves. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. I've got this image in my mind that there'll be the Rockies and on the side of them there'll be this massive fossil of a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rex kind of just lying there. A fantasy idea, Tony. I reckon we should be lucky if we get articulated bones, to be quite honest. I mean, just think that thing has died and then there's going to have been vast earth movements. No, I reckon they'll be a bit more dispersed than that. I mean, have you ever actually handled a fossil? Does Mick Aston count? Our first site is a research dig in the west of the state, sponsored by the Museum of the Rockies. To deter bone thieves, its exact location is a closely guarded secret. It's been codenamed the Bahamas, and although I can't see any beaches or yachts, it's a beautiful place. The site chief is Dave Verricchio. Have you got a dinosaur to show us? We do, we do. A little bit of one anyway. This is our, uh, our quarry here. We're working on a Tyrannosaurid. It's a large predatory dinosaur from about 75 million years ago. Where is it? Where is it? It's mostly <laughs> under uh, plaster jackets. It certainly is. It looks like it's broken every bone in its body. There's a bit of bone poking out here and there. Here's a metatarsal. That's one of the long bones in the foot. Oh, yes. Yeah. I certainly see that. See that, Phil? Yeah. Our first dinosaur bone. Dave, how much of the actual skeleton is here? Uh, this area has most of the skull parts. This big sort of mound in the middle there has lots of vertebrae and ribs. And then portions of the pelvis uh, we remove from the back. 
And you called it a Tyrannosaurid? Yeah, it's a member of the Tyrannosaurid family. Which one is it? Uh, we're not exactly sure, but it's probably something like an Albertosaurus or a Despletosaurus. An Albertosaurus. Sort of smaller cousins of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Oh, here's an Albertosaurus. So that's more or less what we've got. Mm -hmm. But is it actually articulated? No, it's all disarticulated. It's uh, just a big jumble of bones. Now you see, Tony here, he was quite confident that we were actually going to come down here and there was just going to be this massive dinosaur laid out in front of us. I thought we'd have a rock face <laughs> just like this and then you'd see this reclining dinosaur. I think that's in the movie. <laughs> The digging process is a bit of a surprise too. I'd expected to see the paleontologists carefully excavating each bone, cleaning the rock off it as they went until they could lift it pristine and intact. But the bones are extremely delicate, so the idea is to leave as much rock on them as possible, record how they lie, then wrap them in plaster jackets for extra protection. No one really gets to see the bones in their naked glory until they're cleaned up in the labs. The Tyrannosaurid isn't the only dinosaur on this site. Next door to the predator, Dave's found its prey. We have a jumble of hadrosaur bones from probably many individuals all sort of tossed together in the sediments. Hadrosaur? Hadrosaur. Look up in the book. Yeah. It's like a duckbill dinosaur. This H one actually might be closer to a Lambiosaurus. H. Oh, there is one, 187. Oh, that! Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> come on. <laughs> you get taxpayers' money. Yeah, to find you know, like what? That. I mean. <laughs> it's vivid on the page. And unlike the Tyrannosaurid, its bones are vivid in the ground. Oh, wow. What exactly have we got there, Dave? The big bone on the left is the femur. It's one of the large bone from the thigh. And then that kind of long one cutting across is the ulna. We've got a rib coming across here and a vertebrae. It might seem incredibly rude, but I've done quite a bit of digging. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> Is there any chance that, that you would let me have a go on your site? Sure, you bet. Well, yeah, that's just what. I mean, if, you, if you're an excavator, you want to try and do as much as you can in different types of circumstances. Firstly, what am I going to be using? Okay, these are the tools. Paintbrush, I, I can understand that. Yeah, and you can have your choice. That's an oyster knife, actually. Yeah, it's a traditional awl. So, uh, I'm not going to need me trowel after all, then. No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, you could just start up here okay. and then start teasing it off. I mean, the first thing that strikes me is that it's incredibly crumbly. Right. Indeed. Although the two sites are close to each other geographically and in time, they demand different techniques. The Tyrannosaurid bones are densely packed and the rock encasing them is very hard. It would be impossible to extract them one by one, so the paleontologists are simply trying to separate them into manageable blocks, which they'll remove later. But at the Lambiosaur site, it's much more like archaeology. The rock's no harder than soil and the bones are much easier to get at. It's just a matter of scraping till you find one. Oh, right look there. at oh, look at that. Is that bone? That it's got to be bone. Yep. Oh. Oh, it's getting bigger. Centrum? This is a guess right now. Okay, so what's the centrum? It's the center of the vertebrae. Phil's obviously delighted to have found his first ever dinosaur right. bone, yeah. but it's taken him a good hour. And in the meantime, I've been wandering about the site and found all these. Frankie, are they rocks or are they bones? They're bones. Hadrosaur bones. Which makes the score about 10-1 to me. It's, what, <laughs> what, what I'm beginning to realise is when we first came up here, I thought that finding a 
single dinosaur bone would be something that was really rare. But we come up here, it's like a tray full of crisps. In fact, Dave and his team have found hundreds of bones just lying on the surface, and they're full of valuable information. This one, for instance, has a tooth mark on it, suggesting that the lambiosaurs were lunch for a predator. Any idea how many lambiosaurs might be here? Uh, we have several individuals. Uh, probably at least three are represented here. These are scapula shoulder blades, so we have three of those. Can I have a feel? Yeah. There you go, Tony. It's funny, isn't it, because bone is actually very light, but this is definitely the weight of stone. Well, that's just right. I mean, it's, it's totally mineralised, isn't it? Um, the word we like to use is permineralised. Permineralised. Permineralised, yeah, you can say it. <laughs> Permineralisation happens when bones get rapidly covered by layers of sediment, often in streams or lakes. The organic material in the bone quickly decays, leaving a hard, sponge-like shell. Over thousands, perhaps millions of years, the sediments gradually turn to rock. Groundwater percolates through it, leaving mineral deposits in the cavities of the bone. What you're left with is a fossil, a bone frame filled with rock. I've left Phil for about an hour and a half scraping away in his little trench, or quarry as I now understand paleontologists call it. And if we're doing archaeology, an hour and a half would be a perfectly adequate amount of time for him to come up with something good. How you done? Really well, Tony. What do you think of that? There's my bone. Do you remember that? Yeah, Just but that. it's about an inch bigger than it was when I was here last. It is, no, it is enormous. I've exposed it all the way around. I had to clear a lot of dirt all the way around there, clear me away along here, and in the process, look, I found a load more bones into there. I mean, this is a very slow, painstaking business. One more process. Why have you got mustard? There is no meat left on that bone. This container is full up with a hardener, Tony, because that bone is so delicate so I'm about to pour some hardener on it. But that's about got it covered. Is that it? Yeah. Whey. Our first day of dinosaur hunting hey, how about that, then? has been a success. Phil's bagged a lambiosaur, 74 and a half million years older than anything he's excavated before. Well done, mate. But tomorrow, it's my turn. We're going to a brand new site, and I've been promised a crack at a good old-fashioned predator. Join us after the break. <laughs> this is Shoto a small town just down the road from the Bahamas dig. It's at the heart of the Montana dinosaur belt. If you're into dinos, this is the place to be. Which is all very well for the armchair dinosaur hunter, but Phil and I are looking for something a bit more hands-on. And in a one-horse town a few miles up the road, we found it. At Timescale Adventures, members of the public can sign up for a day, a week or a fortnight of hardcore dino hunting. It's a neat idea. Paleontologists, like archaeologists, are always complaining about lack of funds, but not timescale boss Dave Trexler. These people have all paid him good money to come and help him dig up his dinosaurs. In return, they get a basic training in paleontology. It's a really opportunity because, you know, there's not many places you can go as a layperson to, to actually dig bones. They won't let you on the sites. And dinosaurs, to me, were almost like a myth. And so coming out here and actually seeing these bones and the process and how careful you have to be, it's just, it's like a whole new world to me. So it's really exciting. 
It's pretty fun and I like doing this and I like doing the prep work, like gluing the bones together. But um, I don't know if I like to do it as a profession, but it's pretty fun just to do it and come out here. Phil and I can only spare a day. But we've got this bit of the site to ourselves. And the hunting looks great. There's a heck of a lot of bone here, Dave. There's bone all the way down here, all the way down there. There's bone over there, bone right over there, bone there, bone there, bone there. What have you got here? We have the remains of at least eight individuals in this quarry. Uh, two different types of dinosaurs. Uh, five of the individuals are duckbill dinosaurs, and three of them are tyrannosaurid. And what do you think we've got here? This is actually uh, part of the pelvis of one of the tyrannosaurids. This is called the pubis bone. It's the part of the pelvis that sticks forward. And this is part of the ilium, which sticks over the top. So is this where we're going to start this morning? Actually, this area is very delicate. That's the reason we're plastering around it. We're not to the point where we can work on this one. You're saying you don't trust me. <laughs> Actually, I don't trust me. I refuse to work on there myself <laughs> right now. Uh, what we will have you work on, though, is part of the animal back over here that we need to... Uh, Dave wants us to work on an area he's only just started exploring. I can't see any bones, but Dave assures me under here somewhere is another Tyrannosaurid which is much better than Phil's sissy plant eater. Phil, will you be very careful on the edge of my trench, please? <laughs> Ten years I've wanted to say that. <laughs> You'll be using a brush and... Dave gives me my tools, shows me where to scrape, and I'm away. I'm determined to find a bone before Phil. But it's several hours before I get a scent of my prey. I you... found a knobbly thing here, and I don't know if it's bone or rock. Come and have a look. A knobbly thing. It's not what I call an academic. But exciting if it is bone. This is my bone. Is, is that, would that be your first ever bone? In a manner of speaking. <laughs> The bone and rock are so similar, though, I need expert confirmation. Do you think this is bone? This is all dinosaur bone right here. Yes. All the way around. It's bone, Phil. Oh, what? What, well Tony? But I'm discovering what a slow process this is. After nearly a day working at my new bone, it's still firmly rooted in the rock. I'm not going to be able to get this out, am I? Not today. <laughs> Probably not. We're looking at a bone that is liable to take two days of excavation before it's ready to remove. OK, just speculation. What bone could this possibly be from what kind of dinosaur? Of course, it's, it's bad to guess, but it looks like it was the uh, neck vertebrae of a tyrannosaur. Even though I've had to leave my bounty in the ground, I can at least say I've helped to excavate a 75-million-year-old dinosaur. Don't it make you feel good? No. I can go back happy, Phil. I think we can both go back happy, Tony. But schemes like this are controversial. Most of the work, including some fairly technical stuff in the labs, is done by members of the public with little or no paleontological experience. And although Timescale claims it's a non-profit-making organisation dedicated to research, its basic concept is uncomfortably similar to the black sheep of the paleo world. Commercial companies who dig up bones, or indeed charge members of the public to dig up bones, for sale on the open market. There are, are commercial uh, outfits that do excavate and collect data, but a lot of them, the bones are just removed. We lose the data, we lose the research uh, involved with these, these sites. What happens to the bones after your clients have dug them up? Actually, we keep them. Uh, they're permanently in our care, and uh, they remain part of the public trust. Uh, we may not keep them physically on premises. Uh, a lot of times we will loan specimens to other institutions for research or display purposes. But, uh, yeah, they're always in the public trust. But not everyone is as ethical as Dave. 
There are masses of bones for sale around here. The biggest local fossil retailer is the rock shop in Bynum, which just happens to be run by Dave Trexler's mother. Where do you get all your bones from? We buy them. And you don't just advertise where you buy them. They're on private property. And that's about all I say about them. Some people say that it's wrong to sell dinosaur bones. How do you feel about that? A lot of the paleontologists do. And my son Dave won't come in here and sell a bone. I would rather see them taken to school with some child to show and tell. Plus, why not have one on your mantle to look at? Or even on a card table, even on a table, somewhere. Phil and I wondered if this was simply a local phenomenon or part of something much larger. So back at the hotel, we hit the net and discover bones galore. Here we are, Jurassic Age dinosaur oh, bones for sale. Let's have a look at it. Allosaurus metacarpal bone. Very nice, rare bone. Only minimal reconstruction. 450 bucks. Camera. Oh, this is a real beauty. 900 bucks. Awesome, awesome texture. texture and preservation of the small processes. Camera saw us, have we got that? No one's been able to gauge accurately what the global dino bone market's worth, but a recent estimate by the Los Angeles Times puts it at more than $80 million a year and growing. It's very sick, really, I think. You know, I mean, what do people want with one dinosaur bone at that price? The one thing that you really want, sorry to be boring, is context. You want to know where this stuff comes from. And it, it's valueless other than that, and there they are, exchanging good money for stuff which is scientifically valueless, but was probably very, very valuable when it was in the ground. But on the other hand, Phil, if you look through Montana and Utah and Argentina and China, there's a hell of a lot of mountain ranges that seem to be chock-a-block full of bones. Where we were, we were walking on them like they were sherds of pottery from a massive Roman site in the Middle East. Well, I mean, there were that many yeah, of them. Yeah, Can we I'm, begrudge people who've got a little crush on dinosaurs just spending a few bob on a little bone like that? But a lot of that stuff is not unstratified. It's coming straight out of the ground. It, it's being dug out virtually as we speak. And I mean, it's, it's tantamount to just having a dig and flogging off the fines. You don't do it. Luckily, our schedule doesn't leave Phil too much time to wallow in his grief. We've got an eight hour drive to the eastern edge of the state to meet one of the most successful dinosaur hunters in the world, Jack Horner. He's currently digging in the alarmingly named Hell Creek. Apparently it's stuffed full of T-Rexes and we're gonna see his latest discovery. Only problem is, it's halfway up a cliff. Join us after the break. They say I won't stay in a world without love. Hell Creek is home to one of the largest dinosaur excavations in the world. Hidden in these hills and gullies, spread over at least 10 different sites, is a team of 50 paleontologists, all trying to piece together a picture of life here more than 65 million years ago. But you can't dig up a dinosaur until you've found it. So project boss Jack Horner is going to give us a lesson in the most basic skill of dinosaur hunting, prospecting for bones. This, though, is rattlesnake territory and Phil's snake-phobic. 
Even though he's wearing top-of-the-range protection, he's very nervous. You don't, you don't have anything to worry about, if, even if you see a snake. Even if it bites you, you're fine. You're all right. It can't get you in the knees. They can't get that high. Unless, of course, you're down in a valley and he's sitting on the hill. <laughs> Not surprisingly, Phil decides the safest place is at the back. And we're soon trekking in the midday heat into the shadeless badlands. Is the terrain always this difficult? Uh, this is pretty simple terrain here. Simple? And most of our terrain's a lot more difficult than this. There's no great secret to prospecting. All you've got to do is walk for miles and look at the ground. Though whether Phil's looking for bones or snakes, only he knows. See, there's a piece of bone right there. Junk bone. Well, if you, if you look at it, you see that it's, you can see the uh, marrow. Yeah. So it's just a small fragment of a large bone. But that's what we're looking for. A piece of junk bone that we can follow up the hill. And so that, that bone is, is weathered down, is it? It's weathered down, probably on the slope here somewhere. It's come down and... This is exactly like field walking, Tony, isn't it? I mean, it's just a matter of getting your eye in. It really is. Ah! There's an archaeologist looking for bones. Yep, that's a very nice modern bone. For a paleontologist, a modern bone is anything less than several million years old. Phil's, no more than a few decades old, is brand spanking new. Still, I found my first bit of bone. And it was the last bone we saw. But although we were out of luck, sweaty grunt work like this has yielded an astonishing array of finds for Jack and his team. In the Hell Creek area, they found the remains of more than 60 dinosaurs, including 50 triceratops, three hadrosaurs, and seven T Rexes. You say you've discovered seven T Rexes. How many are there in the world so far? Oh, about 22. <laughs> so we've got a, a good third of them. Most of our information about T Rex has come from here. Most of our information about Triceratops. Most of our information about the KT boundary, uh, the, last, the last of the dinosaurs and what happened to them, comes from this area. So this, for dinosaurs, this is a, an extremely important area. The problem is, most of the sites are in very awkward terrain, and none more so than this, the latest discovery. Several miles from base camp, these distant figures are excavating an adult Tyrannosaurus rex, just what we hope to see. And it's where we're going next. It promises to be quite a trip. The sites are all known by the initial of the person who discovered them. B-Rex, as it's called, was discovered by our guide for the day, Bob Harmon. What is it specifically about dinosaurs that really gets you excited? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> They're cool. That's about all I can <laughs> They're <say>. cool. <laughs> you found, actually found this site, didn't you? Yeah. How'd you find it? I'm not looking for dinosaurs. I'm yeah? looking for dinosaurs. Any... How did you feel about it, you know, when you got your first your first T-Rex? Oh, that was exciting. Was there anybody there to share the moment with you? No. Just yourself? Me and a cat of sardines. <laughs> <laughs> the boat was the easy bit. Now we've got an hour-long hike. And with the temperature climbing into the high 90s, it's very hard going. It's easy to see why the people who work at B-Rex camp on site. Looks like we're here. What have you got here? We got ourselves a T-Rex. Oh, 
This right here, what you're seeing is a is a centrum or a piece of a vert. You can see the process is coming off this way. That but thing had a spine some size then. It did, it? did. Yeah, it did. And we're not sure exactly where this came from. So there's, there could be many more verts that are bigger than this or smaller than this. And this right here, this rib. Now this rib was actually hanging out of the side of the cliff in this direction right here. So really, that was one of the first things we went after is that rib to find out. Uh, if it had moved or something, we would have lost this head right here. But as you can see, this head is in beautiful condition. No chunks out of it, no really terrible wear into the bone. Can you show me how much you've taken away since you started? I mean, in rock. burden or rock on top? Yeah. Well, if this, this wall here actually came out away from it and it went up um, you know, 30 feet in there, which, you know, in fact, it, it was overhanging a bit. All this rock. All was, this rock. You, if you just, if you stand way back here, you can see the top layer of mudstone up there, and that came straight out and straight down. But, but, but I mean, just on the basis of two or three bones sticking out of a cliff, how do you actually decide we're going to go for this one? We're that's, actually going to put all this effort <laughs> into having a dig here. That's, that's a good question. I mean, you come here and there's this huge pile of heavy rocks on the top of these, these bones, and you don't know. It's a big guess. I mean, you have to be sure that there's something in there. But the crucial thing that said that it was worth coming in was the preservation of the bone. We've never seen T-Rex bone this well preserved. As well as the rib and vertebra, several other bits of B-Rex are beginning to emerge from the rock. And Phil's got his eyes on the biggest one. So what I'm going to have you do is we need to separate this bone from this bone so we can put them in two different jackets. Right. Now, assuming they're different bones. Right. We always go into the assertion that they might not be, so you're really careful. So we need to trench through here just like this. Right. And you want to stay about an inch away from each one of these bones as much right. as all possible. If I start in there, God, it's, you know, that was amazing because I just eased against it. It's, it's immediately softer than I thought it would. It's, under Nels's watchful eye, Phil's soon quarrying like an old pro. Now this is something that I don't normally get to do on a on a dig. Use hammer and chisel. I tell you. <laughs> I'll have to remember that next time I'm digging up a dead Saxon or something like that. <laughs> you were a bit scathing about archaeologists when I when I turned up on site. Oh no! You I... said you said there's no room for archaeologists here. You said I have to you know I have to have a little humor involved. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in all in truth, we're all diggers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you have to admit dinosaurs are cooler than uh, than uh, than anything else there is to dig up in the world. Cooler, right? cooler. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah more awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're certainly more awesome. With the temperature in the 90s, I don't know whether cool is quite the right word. <laughs> It's going to take at least another year to recover the whole animal. Though Phil's really keen to get his bone out of the ground before the end of the day. But the more he scrapes, the bigger it gets. Nels? Yeah? Have you got a minute? I do. I'm beginning to, beginning to, get, run, beginning to run away with me. Oh. Look, we had this big lump of bone on there to start with, which is where I was trying to trench all the way round. But look, it's, it's folding down there. Look, and it's coming right the way across there. Look, look, and if that cracked surface is bone and that surface there is bone, it's getting enormous. In the end, it turns out to be too big even for Phil to handle, and he has to admit defeat. Created more work for it. That's a major piece of work. <laughs> At the end of the five years, what would you like to walk away from this site having achieved? I hope that, that we will have gathered enough information to, to draw a picture of an ecosystem, of a, of a dinosaur-dominated extinct ecosystem. No, um, I hope we will be able to determine you know, exactly what animals lived in the streams, when the streams flooded, how much rainfall there was, what the climate was like, what the temperature was like, when the storms occurred. And this is our first attempt to really visualize a piece of the past that was filled with dinosaurs. If you say this was our first attempt, then how did people approach 
dinosaur excavation in the past? Well, dinosaur excavations have generally been, you know, you just go out, dig up a dinosaur, bring it back to your museum, shake all the dirt off of it, mount it, put it up, make a big pretty skeleton, go back out and find another one. Some people, you know, have gathered a little bit of evidence to say, to get a general picture of what kind of climates, you know, or what kind of environment the animals lived in, but not specifically, not, not to the degree that we're doing it. In fact, after just three years, Jack and his team already have enough information to produce a basic picture of life here in the Cretaceous. Then Hell Creek didn't exist. The land was flat and sparsely forested with huge trees like giant redwoods. Numerous slow-flowing rivers meandered lazily across the plain. Lizards, mammals, crustaceans and fish all lived here then, but the dominant creatures were the dinosaurs. Herds of hadrosaur, the wildebeest of the Cretaceous, foraged in the savannah alongside triceratops and various other plant eaters, all eyed hungrily by the ever-present T. rex. But this was the very end of the Cretaceous and the dinosaurs. Within a few million years, they'd all be dead. Jim, we've heard so much talk about the KT boundary. What is it? Well, the KT boundary marks the disappearance of dinosaurs from the fossil record. And so the KT boundary separates rocks below that contain dinosaur fossils from rocks above which do not contain dinosaur fossils. And if we look over here on this ridge, we see actually the KT boundary exposed. If you look at the layering in the rocks, what you see are a whole series of black layers, and those layers are coal layers. The lowest coal layer that you see there is the KT boundary. The KT boundary records a huge change in climate. There's much debate about what caused the change, but the most popular theories centre on the impact of a giant asteroid. And do the dinosaur skeletons go actually right up to the boundary? Can we actually say that it looks as though whatever happened, it was that thing that killed the dinosaurs off? Actually, essentially everywhere you look at it, you cannot say that. In fact, what you see is a very, very slow disappearance of dinosaur fossils as you go up towards the boundary. So it's a very gradual disappearance of the dinosaurs. So this thing that everyone was taught at school, that the dinosaurs were all living and happy, and suddenly something went zoomf and wiped them all out, that's not true. That's probably not exactly the way it happened. The effects of that impact probably took hundreds, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of years to play themselves out. The notion that you have from everything you've learned about an asteroid flying over the sky and dinosaurs looking up at it and, <laughs> and it hits the Earth and they fall over all dead all at the same time is not the way in all likelihood happened. We've had a great time in Hell Creek. Especially Phil, who's still bragging about his T-Rex bone. But that's not the only thing bothering me. You know what really frustrates me? We've been here for the best part of a week, and I still haven't seen a clean dino bone. Everyone I've seen has been surrounded by clag and rock. Yeah, but I mean, I suppose it, it, it just reflects the time that you've actually got to, that you've actually got to spend taking out each bone. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that the only way that you're going to actually physically see a bone in, intact, in whole, is actually in a laboratory. Philip, that is precisely where we're going. And we've been promised some big surprises. We've come to the Museum of the Rockies to see bones, and the labs are full of them. The staff have even laid out an Allosaurus skeleton for us. They come in all shapes and sizes, these bones, but with a five-foot diameter, the biggest and weirdest is definitely this. It's a Torosaurus frill, freshly excavated from Hell Creek. The grooves are where the veins ran. The 
the bones are full of information. Amazingly, fossilisation preserves bone cell structure, and this allows scientists like Ellen Lamb to build up a detailed picture of individual animals. This, for instance, is a fossilised turtle bone, and the growth rings show it was unusually old when it died. Celeste Horner is building a virtual T-Rex. By scanning its bones into a computer, she can recreate its movement. And the results look set to cause a big stir. From the information that we have now, T-Rex could not really um, maneuver side to side like an athlete would and the kind of action that you'd need if you were a hunting animal. We see a T. rex had very small arms. That would be a great disadvantage if you're a hunter. Um, it has almost equal thigh and shin bone proportions, uh, which is not what you would expect in a fast runner. A fast runner usually has a short thigh bone and a long shin bone. In other words, T. rex might not have been the fearsome predator portrayed in books and movies. Celeste thinks he's more likely to have been a scavenger, a kind of giant prehistoric hyena, which just goes to show how misleading appearances can be. Getting the bones into shape for all this analysis is the job of preparators like Jamie Jett. Somewhere in this jacketed lump of rock is a dinosaur bone. In fact, this one is from Dave Verricchio's Bahamas site, so there's likely to be a jumble of them. Ah, here, this is, ah, this is. here we go. Whew. That made me blow a bit. There's some dinosaur bones. So the job now is to get all of this matrix off of this, these bits of bone that are in here. How long will it take you to get all this rock off and clean this up? If I'm lucky, maybe a couple of months. <laughs> if I have trouble getting the rock loose from the bone, it can take anywhere up to six months. And you can see why. Jamie can't just hack at the rock for fear of damaging the bone. Instead, she's got to remove it millimetre by millimetre. It requires almost surgical skill, but the effort's worth it. All this stuff came from your side? This is uh, last year's collection. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is. When you see it in the rock, it doesn't look as though you'll ever get it to this stage. What's this bit here? That's one of the belly ribs. Look at that. Good Lord. I know you're nowhere near finished, but from the evidence that you've pulled together so far, what can you tell about this animal? Well, we can definitely tell it's a Tyrannosaurid. From the material we worked on this summer, we can actually tell it's a Displetosaur, so a particular type of Tyrannosaur. We can tell it's larger than our other specimens, so this is probably a, a full adult animal. Yeah, and we can see that on, uh, here's a toe bone. So this is just one of the bones from the foot. Good Lord. And uh, we can compare that with our other specimen. Why don't you hang on to that? Yeah. And then... Where's the other specimen? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> We're back in the movies. One day, one day, yours will look like that. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. So which one is? This one matches this bone here, yeah. Let me get that out. Yeah, so you can God. see. It's oh, bigger, isn't it? Your one, yeah. 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 And this actually is a fairly mature individual. So ours is definitely a mature individual. And we also have some unique features too some pathologies, ah, ah. injuries to the bones. Yeah. And uh, this bone that you picked up earlier is actually one of them. This is the belly rib. Um, and so you can see it sort of has a normal portion down here, yeah. and then we get to this area here and things really go haywire. That's not just because it's been smashed up? No. So does that mean that during its lifetime it had an injury and that healed? Right, well I'd say it, I'm not sure it actually healed. It, the bone reacted to that injury. So it didn't die of that injury? Uh, that's a good question. It could have. I mean, this, I'll show you. Uh, this is what it should look like, this end of the bone. It should be very flat. And instead, we have this large cavity, which suggests there's some kind of maybe an infection or tumor growing within the bone. 
This is beginning to feel like archaeology again. The only difference is, on Time Team, we're used to getting results in three days, not six months. Nevertheless, Dave's Daspletosaur, one of only four in the world and probably the most complete, is slowly coming to life. But most of its bones are still in the ground. So on our last day, we're heading back to the Bahamas to help Dave get them out. They've finally been isolated into clumps, recorded and jacketed. Now it's just a matter of getting them off the site and back to the preparators. We have a special tool for this called the Dino Killer. The Dino Killer. The dino killer. <laughs> that. Looks like a big hammer to me. This, this is the Dino Killer. Oh, good God, that's a good tool. I can equate with tools like this. Right then, so what do we do with the Dino Killer? Hey. Basically, we have to drive, basically drive it under this. But since the bed's dipping this way, we don't want to drive it horizontally, but down at an so angle. So in there. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, Oh, wow. Well, it's right. right it's good. Yeah, it's yeah, gone. Yeah, it's gone. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, oh, I think you got stand. Okay, okay. Are right, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Can you back? Just a little bit. Let's pull it over. Let's go. Come on, come on. Bring it over. Hey. Now the dino's dead, the fun really begins. Each of the jackets weighs around half a ton, and we've got to carry them up the gully to where the trucks are parked. Sometimes it's really light, and then the weight shifts. <laughs> it's incredibly heavy. <laughs> so this is why Dave wanted us back. Got it. Oh. How do we get it in? Oh, oh I'm right. Just to help through the passive. Right. Right. That's it. Okay. What sticks in your mind most about our little adventure? I think it's the passion of the paleontologists for their subject. Uh, I mean, they really, really care. And there they are, they're, they're struggling to actually reconstruct the lives of dinosaurs with such little amount of evidence. You know, and, and in such a hostile environment. They care passionately about dinosaurs, just the way I do about archaeology. Would you do it again? Well, you bet I would. And you know, I reckon I could do it too, you know, I mean, after so many years in archaeology, I think I've kind of mastered all those skills that are necessary to excavate. Once a digger, always a digger. When I first came here, what is it, three weeks ago, of course I knew that dinosaurs had once existed, but they were like a sort of fantasy to me. But in exactly the same way as when I first started doing archaeological digs, it brought people like the Romans and the Saxons to life for me. I now really believe that the dinosaurs lived and occupied this space and are just as much part of the history of our world. Come on, Phil. <laughs>